Voilà, mesdames et messieurs. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, controversy uh, number six of the 23rd uh, Encontre Economique of Aix-en-Provence with two uh, well-known people uh, who uh, characterize risk and progress, the, the history past and present, Etienne Klein, historian and physicist, and Thomas Verbal, the CEO of uh, AXA, the worldwide uh, insurance group, of course. Thank you very much, both of you, for being with us. Uh, Etienne, we're going trying to see uh, what impact risk can have on uh, progress. Uh, when I was asking what is progress and we can link progress to risk in a country that has uh, been through the Enlightenment with Condorcet and D'Alembert and others. Yes, hello everybody. The answer to the question would require several hours of discussion to be uh, to simplify a little bit. I would just like to quote Emmanuel Kant who wrote a book in the 19th century which uh, the uh, title of the book is uh, What are the Lights? Uh, and the answer was that the idea of progress is an idea that is doubly consoling and he adds sacrificial. What does he mean by this? It is consoling because it enables us to think that our children will have a better life than we have. And it consoles us for the unhappiness of the present, but it, he adds that it is also consoling because it gives a meaning to the sacrifices that it requires. In other words, when you believe in progress, you have to agree to sacrifice yourself in the name of a certain philosophy of history. To say it in one sentence, believing in progress is accepting that you will sacrifice your personal present in the name of a collective future which has been configured in advance in a credible and attractive way. So this is the uh, to show the, how we, much we have changed compared to the situation that Kant uh, describes, I read the articles that were published in May 1842. At, in France, at Modon, there was a major railway accident in France, the first major railway accident between Versailles and Paris. There was a derailment of a train that caught fire. The doors were closed to unlock to prevent people uh, committing suicide because people were committing suicide by jumping off the train, off the bridge onto the train. There were several uh, 150 people killed and there were several hundred people were injured. And of course, the uh, press launched a whole debate about whether it was reasonable to use a, a, rail, a railway, uh, a train. That's when the good on the 8th of May, 42. And three days later, this is what you can read of the newspaper of the day. Meudon is one of these exceptional unexpected accidents, but the population should not be frightened since technical progress and additional precautions should make it possible to avoid them. Four days later, the, journal, the newspaper of Rouen says the disaster of Rouen should not put us off using trains. We should take more precautions and we need to learn from this uh, disaster. The debate was acted upon by Le Martin, who was an MP at the time. On the 11th of May 1842, in the chamber, uh, he talked about the accident and ended his speech by saying, we should feel, feel pity for them and feel pity for ourselves, but let's, let's continue. In other words, it's not just a single accident that should prevent the march of progress. I think that our relationship with risk, the day has completely reversed. In other words, now, we, we do not refuse the, to associate risk with something that is a sacrifice so that uh, the risk is no longer seen as a price to pay to have something that is an improvement, but on the contrary, as a symptom of uh, an overall uh, disorganization that has to be corrected. Thomas Bell, when we listen to uh, Etienne Klein, we think that we realize that the risk has followed progress. Progress was put in place, we think about uh, railways, and of course we all remember this terrible accident which uh, led to a lot of uh, articles being written. Would you say that insurance, by definition, is there to, uh, in fact, the insurer risk, does this mean that uh, it has to follow risk and not precede uh, progress? For me, it's the other way around. For me, progress is the result of taking risks. And I'm very happy that during our debate uh, here, we have a lot of people talking about the subject of progress, which has been forgotten a little bit. 
because if we look at uh, our customer base and in society in general, we do a report on future risks every year, and, if we, and we see the following subject. The risks around us are increasing, the re societies are becoming more and more vulnerable, they do not want to take more risks, and our societies have less and less trust in institutions, in other words, uh, enterprises, to resolve these risks. At the same time, we are confronted by new risks, which we've never seen before, the pandemic, the climate uh, transition, and uh, cyber, and we have to do something. And I think we are, are now at a very crucial point with a great reversal of the risks in our peoples. But nevertheless, with a good understanding of the risks around us, and we know we have to do something. So insurance is always at the center of this, because if we remember the history of insurance, I'll give you a little history lesson. It was the sailors at the time who said, we are putting capital together. It was Lloyd's at the time, because the loss of the vessel is so penalizing for one of the entrepreneurs. If we share this risk, it's much better. In other words, risk taking is not done at any price. We have to take risks that are measured, but we have to take these risks in order to make progress. I'd like to also ask Etienne about the future and risk in a specific French case. Is there something I think is very important? There's a cyber risk. We have been through the health uh, pandemic uh, with an identified virus, and here, Mr. Burble, we have the impression that with uh, cyber, with a cyber risk, it's like a digital pandemic which might contaminate the whole of the IT system. So by assuming such a risk will be a, a phenomenal undertaking, it's a new risk, as uh, quite right, and it's uh, digital in the digital uh, risk, which we've never seen before. The classic mechanism of uh, risk uh, sharing is that with our three of us, each one of us is going to put some money on the table, and if one of us is ill, this person will take the money and the others remain in good health. With the cyber risk, everybody is sick. Potentially all at the same time, yes. Because with the connectivity we have, this is what is going to happen. So for me, there are two solutions to look at. First of all, how can we create more private uh, public mechanisms to to plan for such uh, events, a public-private partnership. These don't exist at the moment in insurance. We see these sometimes in uh, uh, disaster management, but not in the cyber area. But then we need to see, think about how we can do a lot more prevention to, first of all, avoid and reduce risk and better manage risk, and also to be fully prepared when the risk occurs, because it's not a question of if it happens, it, when it happens. Etienne Klein digital artificial intelligence, all of these are real uh, uh, representations of progress, which are pushing us uh, to progress even further in intellectual terms. Yes, uh, you're distinguishing between progress, which is a kind of ideology of beliefs, in a way, because for progress to occur, you have to believe, because if you don't believe, you don't do anything for it to take place. Progressism is a kind of uh, pushing mechanism, which means we're constantly innovating. I'd like to talk about uh, the concept of risk. Why is it a risk called a risk? An English sociologist called David Fleming, who invented the principle of reverse uh, assessment of risks, the idea he defends that for us as human beings, we consider that a risk, for us to consider a risk a risk, we have to be able to imagine the measures that will reduce the risk measures uh, at the design level for in terms of prevention and technical uh, solutions. If we can't imagine a way of reducing the risk, the risk is no longer a risk, it's part of the human condition. This definition makes the risk uh, proliferating because we can always imagine a measure that can reduce a certain risk or another risk, and we are obsessed by the idea of reducing risks. Another thing I wanted to say about the idea of risk is that it is different from uh, danger. Risk is not the same thing as danger. There has to be a probability of exposure. For example, of a mountaineering. Those of you who never go to, into the mountains, mountaineering is not a risk because the probability of a fall is reduced to zero because 
uh, somebody who doesn't go mountain swimming isn't going to have any risk of falling. So the risk, notion of risk is quite subtle, and today it's, it has come proliferating for the reasons I've just explained, but also because technology is entering every part of our lives because of digital technology, but also because our worry and concern in penetrates everywhere. And the fact that technology and concern both infiltrate in themselves into our lives means that the uh, idea of risk is ever present and leads to a form of anxiety, which has been perfectly well documented today. The last thing I'd like to say is that I saw in the program that the word progress is involved in a lot of the controversies and uh, roundtables. But if with a roundtable and using technology, you look at the presence of the word progress and the frequency of use in public discourse, we can see, that in fact, the word has completely disappeared. It started to reduce in 1980s in the rate of uh, use, and then it's now it's been com completely replaced by innovation. And uh, I think this is the, my th thesis that I want to defend. The fact that we've replaced the word progress by the word innovation, which seem to be synonyms, in fact does not do justice to the idea of progress. And in addition, it creates additional anxiety. Why is that? Because the idea of progress was based on the idea of time that was passing, that is constructing something. Time is our ally. It is helping us be free and uh, helping us accomplish our uh, will. That was the idea of progress. And so we configure the future in advance in a credible and attractive way, and we work hard to make it become a reality. Innovation, on the other hand, I won't uh, go through the whole history of this word, but innovation is a word that paradoxically is attached to conservation. And the word appeared in uh, Lower Latin in the 12th century. Uh, it was called, uh, what we called innovation, was something you had to change in a contract for the contract to become valid. Because of a change that had occurred in the somewhere in the contract. So, uh, in fact, that day was a question of changing, so nothing would change. And the word has kept this meaning. Today, it's the critical state of the present that justifies innovation. We have to do this or that to prevent the world being uh, collapsing and not creating a new world. So implicitly, innovation is based on a concept of time that is passing, but is more corrupt corruptional. The more time that passes, the worse the situation becomes. And so we have to innovate to keep the world in its current state. And implicitly, this is something that creates anxiety. Thomas Wobbling, concerning the idea of a risk, there's one subject that strikes me and you have these double, these two cultures, you know, both German and French. In French law, in French constitution, since uh, Jacques de Chirac inserted it in the constitution, we have the idea of the precautionary principle. We've talk, been talking about progress, innovation, and covering risks. The fact that, and here I'd like you to have this double approach, Franco-German approach. The fact that we have uh, part of the French constitution that incorporates the idea of a precautionary principle isn't this a way, although you can ensure a risk, isn't a way of perverting progress and perhaps even innovation. For me, this isn't contradictory because for me, a precaution is linked to the controlled risk taking. We shouldn't take any kind of risk. You have to know what the risks are and see how you can better control them, either by sharing them, you come together and you try to diversify, or you work on the prevention to, uh, prevent, to uh, prevent the risk. So prevention does work. We confronted with a lot of natural disasters, and I'm sure you remember the Katrina hurricane at the time, which cost the double of the Yan hurricane, which had the same dynamic and the same path, which occurred last year. This means that more or less we have divided the costs in two, because in that period of eight or ten years, the uh, states and the citizens uh, invested in prevention. And it has worked. I think today we've probably forgotten that now. If I look at our customers, they are perfectly prepared to invest in the prevention of uh, their car breaking down, but they are not ready to invest in their health and prevention of risks in companies. We have to change the way people look at risks, and the precautionary principle also means that you have to alert people about the risks, and this is what they can do, what they can do to reduce these risks. 
risk, risk taking and risk management is not the responsibility of the state or somebody else. It's up to all of us to be aware and to be active and uh, fully participatory in risk management. Thomas Bell, let me be a bit direct. I hear a lot of people, a lot of company leaders and business leaders uh, from the insurance world talking about the public-private partnerships and calling for these kind of partnerships to ensure the new risks, especially the cyber risks. Sorry to be so direct and a bit ironic, but is this to help the insurance companies to take the risk with their margins by sharing the risk with the gate, or is it because the risks are so huge that the insurers won't have the means to cover the risks? It's the second uh, one is the answer. The risk of the pandemic, uh, a digital pandemic or a cyber risk is a systemic risk. I'll come back to my example of us three. Let's say all the three of us break down all of us at the same time. This means you have to have somebody who has to help us. That has to be the state. On the other hand, the cyber risk is uses prevention a great deal because if today a company is protected from the inside and from the outside, and if we avoid something from happening, this means we can reduce the cost and the risk. I think the three parts have to work together, each one in its own corner, with their aligned interest to find a solution. Today, we can fully understand the problem, but we haven't yet found the solutions. Etienne, just a few words. Earlier we were talking about innovation shouldn't be confused with progress. Isn't it perfectly normal, in fact, that we should confuse these two things? When we you know we have a rep, uh, candidate erected twice in France, you talked about the startup nation. Without innovation, you can't have progress. Yes, I think that's for other reasons. The Enlightenment philosophy, which makes the word progress, uh, which has given it the meaning it has today, the word to progress is a very old world word which had a spatial aspect. When you talked about progress, it meant an army was moving forward in space. And in the 18th century, we thought, well, we could, if we can move forward in space, perhaps we can also move forward in time and progress in time and improve over a period of time. That's where the, the philosophy of the Enlightenment invented this idea of the progress and theorized it. But it theorized it with a, in a very naive way. For example, Condorcet imagined there would be an automatic clutch system between the different, different types of progress, between scientific progress, which would lead mechanically to technical progress, which would then uh, lead to material progress and moral progress and political progress. For example, in the Cyclopedia, in an article entitled uh, Geometra, which means a mathematician, Talonberg concludes saying, take a tyrannical nation, train some geometers, some mathematicians, so a little bit later, the people will be freed of their yoke. Talonberg uh, didn't know about North Korea, where there are fantastic mathematicians. So it's not as simple as that. I think the course of history ever since the Enlightenment has shown us the uh, naivety of the definition of progress, which originally uh, uh, applied to the whole of the humankind. For example, in technical levels, it's impossible to uh, dispute uh, the importance of progress, but humanity doesn't live in the same conditions. There are huge inequalities, and all of this makes us uneasy. And because we are uneasy, because we see that we're going to be going to the planet Mars when people are living and sleeping on the streets in Paris, we've abandoned that word progress. We've replaced it with the word innovation, thinking that in that way we were going to modernize the idea of progress. And in fact, in a way, we have betrayed it. So somebody who's a, who believes in progress, rather than abandoning the word progress, they should apply it to themselves. In other words, the question is, can we believe, should we believe or not believe in progress? And the question is, can we make progress with the idea of progress? Can we redefine it? And I have a solution which is based on my experience of thought. If you take a time capsule that contains some Enlightenment philosophers, such as D'Alembert and Diderot and Condorcet and other uh, people such as Spencer, in this time capsule, you take them from the 18th century to 2023, and you get them to discover our world. Not straight away, because they'll go completely mad, but you put them in different situations, which you can imagine. And we try to understand what their situation would be in a particular environment that we could show them today. And you can quite clearly say there are cases where they'd be completely astonished, 
and they would realize that they, we've gone much further than they could have imagined. And in other cases, they will consider that we have gone backwards. And if we take stock in that way, we look again at the idea of progress so that it becomes more suitable to the situation we're in today. Because if it's difficult to reintroduce this into the collective imagination, the difference between 18th century or the 19th century or 20th century and now is that when a scientist talks about the future now, I'm not talking about scientists or talking about particle physics or cosmology who continue to make a stream with the black holes and the pile stars and the gravitational fields. I'm talking about scientists who talk about the climate, about biodiversity and pollution. When they talk about the future, it's credible because they're scientists, but it's not attractive. So the idea of progress, which uh, assumed that the configuration of their future would be both credible and attractive, is no longer the case. When it's not credible, it's not attractive, and uh, the two go together. Uh, perhaps uh, we could take a couple of questions from the room. Artificial intelligence is everywhere. It's uh, an idea that will deliver progress, although it uh, led, led to a kind of uh, uh, panic in a way because people were thinking that uh, the jobs that we have today are going to despair in 10 or 5, 15 years' time. We don't even know what kind of training we need to give people so that they'll be able to find a job in 10 or 15 years' time. What about uh, the training, for example, in calculating risk-taking? Is that going to be something that's going to be extremely useful or uh, is it an innovation that completely uh, goes beyond what you can do? Today we are in a phase where we are opening up a beehive and the bees are flying in all directions. We don't know which bees are going to sting us and which bees are going to be nice to us. It's really the, an exploratory phase of artificial intelligence at the moment. Once we have better understood how we can use it and where the dangers lie, not only the ethical dangers but a lot of other dangers in terms of criminal activity as well, I think then we will be able to realize that for some of our sectors there are huge advantages to be gained. On one hand, we can automate a great deal. In other words, people who work with customers can spend, can listen to the customers much more and deal with the real problems of customers instead of having to waste their time in administrative tasks. But on the other hand, the risk management and prevention with all of the massive amounts of data are going to open us up to us lots of opportunities. Today, for example, we already have companies who improve uh, planting and to carry out thermal uh, renovation to show people where fires are going to occur to reduce the risk of fires. That's not going to work if we don't use the power of data and the power of AI. I'll take some questions from the audience. First of all, a question for you, Etienne. When we talk about uh, logical progress, is that going to lead to economic progress and social progress? So in reality, it's a central question in a country like ours, because uh, technological progress, if it doesn't lead to economic and social progress, in reality, in medium term, people will refuse technological progress. It doesn't give them any extra well-being. It's quite, it's important to link uh, the past with the present. How do we measure progress? What I'm worried about is that if you read uh, D'Alembert's uh, and Didio's Encyclopedia from the end of the 18th century, which is illustrated by figures and illustrations which explain how at the time the technical objects functioned, and when in the introduction to the encyclopedia they explained why they did this, made this choice of explaining technical objects in agriculture, etc., they say more, the more technology is used in people's everyday lives, as they call it, the more technologies will be familiar and the more the scientific principles that make them possible will be known to the people. In other words, to sum up, technology will be a vector for ed scientific education. That might have been the case at uh, certain periods. Now it's completely uh, wrong because the most complex objects which are familiar to us are so easy to use and so user-friendly that we don't need to know how they work in order to use them. And so, paradoxically, technology moves us away from science. And the question is, are we going to continue being the masters of a technology? Though to be able to understand it, you have to know a lot about science. You don't need to know a lot about science in order to use it. So, Thomas Birbel, a question for you. You've raised, uh, talked about the cyber risk. There's a question that says, Thomas Birbel, 
talks about this uh, cyber risk, and yet the media are always talking about the climate risk. Isn't it also important for a group like AXA to, uh, or not? What is the biggest risk? Is it cyber or climate? We always tend to talk about climate, or is it both, perhaps? As I said, we do uh, been doing a feature risk report for the last 10 years. Over the last few years, we've, we always see, apart from the COVID year, when uh, the health risk was uh, first. Otherwise, it's always between the two, cyber and then the climate transition risk. These are the two major challenges we have today. We don't yet have an answer. And to come back to the question you asked, Etienne, I think it's important to bring our societies towards something where people can see they will increase their well-being and will bring them advantages in their everyday lives, for example, uh, by fighting against cybercrime and uh, helping them with the climate transition. Today, I don't think we do enough, we don't do enough change management to help people to uh, enable us to benefit from progress, and this causes a lot of fragmentation, and we're still suffering from that today. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. If you could give a round of applause to our two speakers, Thomas Merbel and Etienne Klein.